So Steve, you were telling me a few minutes ago about the Cubs and how you uh, went from being a fan to being someone who had a one-year project for um, an arts council. I had, yes, I, was, I had come originally to do my thesis to go to graduate school at the Art Institute mm -hmm. on Wrigley Field as a really unique place in American culture. At that time, it was the only, it was the only daylight ballpark mm -hmm. left and it was in the neighborhood and had all that mystique going for it and all this you know, crazy fandom that had, it, it had existed. And I didn't get a scholarship for the Art Institute, but I, my parents offered to let me stay on the couch. Mm -hmm. So I got a job as a waiter, and at that time it was all daytime, and I, so I could work mm -hmm. at the ballpark in the day and wait tables at night. Right. And the Wrigley, comp the Wrigley family had given me complete access to the ballpark and the team for a year. And when the Tribune Company bought them, they honored that agreement. Mm -hmm. So they let me spend the whole 82 season just shooting around the ballpark, learning, to, learning about sports, learning about the players, getting to know the culture of baseball. And I got along with everybody really well. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year, the guy that had been their team photographer for many years had decided to retire. And they asked me if I wanted to stay on. And I was like, <laughs> Right place yeah. at the right time. So you must have been pitching yourself that first year here at Wrigley Field. Was that, was that a reaction? Did you actually literally pinch yourself? I was, I was like, I was in, 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 amazed that I could be doing this. I had never had an interest in being a sports photographer. I'd always come out of the fine art tradition and wanted to be a documentary photographer mm -hmm. or sort of a street photographer kind of person. And I had to learn to do action sports. What was the hardest part about making that transition? Uh, learning the, tech, the technical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Learning how to use lenses, how to, to auto, to, before autofocus, how to manually focus, mm -hmm. how to read light, how to shoot all on transparency film. Because mm -hmm. when you work for magazines, you had to shoot transparencies. And there was no room for error. So you learn quickly right. to, to, to look at light. This is a night game in June after the 21st when the days are really long. Mm -hmm. When you go to the ballpark and the sun's out and there's no cloud, they cast this great shadow. Mm -hmm. So I, know, I knew to go to the upper deck mm -hmm. to go down to photograph and wait for something like this, mm -hmm. which may or may not happen. So you always want this kind of thing or somebody sliding in or running or mm -hmm. swinging the bat at the plate mm -hmm. and waiting. So I know that there is no such thing as a typical day at Wrigley Field, but if you could walk us through a little bit of what you do as you go to the park and, and walk us through that from there. In general, I'm there three to four hours ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. So I park, I get there, I get all my equipment together, clean, all the cards ready, make sure everything's charged. Then I go meet with our publications staff and I get a sheet every day about pictures they're looking for, stories we're working on, uh, celebrities that are coming, important things that are happening, then I'll get that from our marketing guys too. And then I'll go into the clubhouse and I'll see if you know players, they've asked me for pictures of themselves, we're trying to set up a photo shoot. Um, I'll, and, I, and, and that's when I'll take some of my behind the scenes pictures. Mm -hmm. I always have a camera with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked real hard over the years to, to gain the trust from those guys to shoot mm -hmm. in the clubhouse. Sutcliffe, I've known his entire career with the Cubs, is you know, with us from when he got traded in '84, mm -hmm. and I traveled with with them during that year. Mm -hmm. And Kerry, who I've known, I was there when they signed his contract, and we took pictures of him signing well, his we contract. He's a kid out of Texas. Wow. And this is just a moment where Sutcliffe was. I think he was uh, broadcasting an ESPN game, and I had him throw out the first pitch. And this is uh, right in front of his locker, and he was just in the clubhouse messing around with Kerry mm -hmm. about, "You ever going to be have a full season?" Uh -huh. you know? Giving them a little, and that's one of the things with the clubhouse is a lot of the the way they they kind of haze or, or the yeah. humor involved. So, and did you have a hazing process yourself that you went yeah, through? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the first time I uh, first or second year doing uh, spring training headshots, mm -hmm. I was uh, photographing the guys as they came through, and you get just a couple minutes with each mm -hmm. guy. And Sandberg was in line behind me and I was photographing somebody and I was very nervous at the beginning of my career mm -hmm. there because I, I, I didn't know and I was intimidated by these guys. And I'm looking, looking, looking and I, I smell something burning and I think it's my strobes going off. And I'm looking around and I see everybody laughing. I look down, he had lit my shoes on fire. Hot foot. He gave me a hot foot. Mm -hmm. And he was, they were laughing and laughing and laughing. And so you were one of the guys then, that was part of the process. After I didn't like freak out, you know, I just had somebody, they, I just poured some coke or whatever I was drinking on my shoes and we went on with it. Baseball players have rituals. Wade Boggs would run at a certain time, his wind sprints, jumping over the white lines. Do you have some rituals? I put on my headphones and I put on music for the whole game. Interesting. Tell me about that. Why, why do you make that choice? And how long have you been having that be part of your... Forever. Okay. I, I, because the game is right there. 
and everything else is a distraction. Okay. Anybody, ta you know, people talking or people want to ask you a question, and it gets me into a, a space, you know, right. a mood to, to, to focus. So what's on your iPod? Well, mostly jazz, classical mm. music, reggae, very yeah. kind of mellow stuff. Okay. Yeah, no Led Zeppelin. No. No, the acoustical Jimmy, Jimmy Page. The photography that you do, it seems to me that it would hold great appeal for everyone, but especially for people who don't necessarily follow baseball at all. Yeah, it's a little more iconic. Mm -hmm. and, the, and it's about the beauty of the game, the beauty of the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really given uh, this privilege to be behind the scenes, that I'm, I'm allowed to be where nobody else is to be. Mm -hmm. And my, my responsibility and my integrity is to be the eyes that the fans want to have. Mm -hmm. I'm the, to be able to see what they can't see. Right. I can go in the clubhouse, I can go on the scoreboard, I'm there before the gates open. I'm allowed to go anywhere. Nature plays a huge role I'm looking at some of these beautiful photos, and some of them seem like they, they're an artist drew them. I look at a lot of art. I mean, I grew up in fine arts. I grew up painting. I grew up drawing. Loved photography my entire life. I used to look and look and look and look and look at everybody's work. And somehow that trains you to see things mm -hmm. and anticipate things. And that, that picture in particular has to do with being there at every game, because mm -hmm. that came together in a matter of moments. Yeah. And I was on the, uh, the third baseline shooting the game. And I look up and saw the sky doing what it does around the lake. And I thought, okay, this could be amazing. So I ran up to the upper deck. And just how, how ephemeral this whole thing is. It just, and it's really about, it's all about this. Yeah. And this, this golden light down here. How many, how many of these 35,000 or so fans do you think were aware of that going on? You know, I don't know. It's really curious. I get the guy at the bleachers less, saw it less than the guys here <laughs> for many reasons. One of the greatest pieces of advice I'd ever gotten was to create your own luck, to create the situation where luck happens in front of you. Um, one of my mentors, a guy named Walter Yost, who mm -hmm. was a really famous Sports yeah. Illustrated photographer, right. guy that did the, that Dwight Clark catch and, mm -hmm. and all that, and the Jordan covers. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he was all about put yourself in a situation where luck can happen in front of you. Right. You know, nobody's lucky. They would just put themselves in a situation for it to happen. And that really clicked for me. Right. How much of that photo's power is attributable to his stubble? Oh, the whole thing. The stubble, the sneer, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the faded background in the dugout. You know, it's, it's, it's just such a moment that you can never get him to do. And it looks like there's a, is this a, an interview with the media? Yeah. OK, see, so a recorder. Do you recall what he was responding to there? Uh, this was, was, I think he was talking about Ichiro. Because we were, this was in uh, at Peoria at the Mariners Ballpark in spring training, and, okay. and it was more like, I think he was talking between, about Ichiro and um, Fukudome, okay. and he was kind of tired of answering all those questions. Kind of, he gets to a point in an interview, he was kind of like, what? So the Cubs played an instrumental role in your family actually happening. Your children are born as a result of your association with the Cubs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, a friend of mine had. Uh, was trying to raise money for a theater. And he was looking for pr prospective investors. And he uh, had wanted to talk to my wife's parents about doing it. And, and my wife's uh, grandmother, who was an enormous Cub fan. Mm -hmm. So he asked me if I could arrange to get tickets for them to come down to the ballpark. And could I get a picture of her on the field? So I, you know, I said, yeah, but I, you know, I don't want to meet, you know, I don't want to deal with anybody. I'll mm -hmm. get you the tickets. You handle the family. Just do that, and we'll get the grandmother to take a picture, and we'll get her off the field. I'm looking around the crowd like we all do, and it's kind of scanning for girls and, 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 and everything. And, and I saw this girl up there. I said, man, she's really pretty. He said, well, that's her granddaughter. And he said, well, maybe we should meet her. And I said, ah, yeah. So then there was a rain delay. And I went into the concourse to meet up my friend Michael. And he introduced me to everybody. And right. I met my, my, my future wife and called her up and said right. we should come out. And, she said, sure. So what do you think? No rain delay? Does that change your fate? <laughs> no rain delay changes my fate. 